Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the August 2021 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of the China-USSR unification is a fundamental necessity to confront the nuclear war by Jay Posadas from 1974. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So just a brief preface from me. Uh, this channel is not Posadist per se. Uh, we cover Posadas out of some of the public curiosity about this figure who is known for having quote-unquote far-out views on UFOs and nuclear war and other subjects. So to some extent, it simply serves to attract some interest to the channel. Uh, although beyond that, this is eh, about as close as we get to Trotskyism. I think that Trotsky made some useful contributions over the course of his life, and those contributions should be appreciated and studied as such. However, I'm not a Trotskyist, and uh, I don't uh, generally endorse Trotskyist takes on things in general. Uh, that said, Posadas was the pseudonym of a group, primarily of just one Argentine Trotskyist, uh, although sometimes other people used the name. They started out as the head of the South American branch of the Fourth International, that being a Trotskyist organization. Uh, but later, Posadism kind of branched off into its own thing and uh, diverged from mainline Trotskyism becoming more of a thing in itself, however still bearing strong traces of that source Trotskyism. All of that said, sometimes I just like reading Posadas because it is different. It is socialist, but it is quite different from other things. By the time that Posadas was writing, 60s, 70s, 80s, we're well into the age of many different strains of Marxism, and I find it helpful to use a variety of sources because even if you don't agree with an overall philosophy, or with an overall interpretation. Sometimes still in a text, there will be very useful and interesting gems that you're better off for having exposed yourself to. Anyway, with all that said, let's get into the text of the China-USSR unification is a fundamental necessity to confront the nuclear war. Capitalism prepares the final settlement of accounts. It prepares to resolve the question of the final confrontation of system against system by means of the nuclear war. The task then is to combine the preparation of oneself for that war with the expansion of the world revolution and the development of Soviets everywhere. One slogan and central preoccupation as the most fundamental necessity of humanity is the unification of China, the USSR, and all the workers' states. Let the masses of China, the USSR, and all the workers' states discuss this matter. 90% of their masses will opt for unification. The division between the USSR and China is not inevitable. It is the apparatuses that are divided. The masses are not. Of all the apparatuses, the Chinese proves itself to be the most pernicious and the most backward. It is leaving no room for the active participation of the masses. There is a much greater participation of the masses in the USSR. Comment coming from a Trotskyist. That's saying a lot. Also, in the Soviet Union, there is a tradition of participation and a real objective and active intervention of the masses. This is one reason why the USSR intervenes in the world process of the revolution and even in China. When the Soviet Union made declarations to influence the Chinese, the Chinese leaders said, the Soviets speak to defend themselves. We said that it was a lie and that if there was a morsel of truth in this, it was entirely secondary. The Soviets intervene because the Soviet's worker's state has reached a structure that demands a world in its own image, if the worker's state is to exist and progress. When the world has become a worker's state, there will be no room for bureaucracy. It is absurd to think that bureaucracy can construct the world. Stalin was eliminated, and the worker's state progressed all the more for being rid of him. The world today shows that the changes for the better continue in spite of bureaucracy, and indeed that bureaucracy itself can no longer be strictly bureaucratic and has to react in a partially correct manner to historic necessity. The worker state had degenerated from its origin, but this degeneration did not go as far as destroying it. It is a degeneration resulting from Stalin's policy and the interests of the layer he represented in appropriating power. This paralyzed the worker state and kept it aloof from any important activity 
in the world class struggle during that epoch. But capitalism did not have the strength to destroy the workers' state. Today, it is all the opposite. The Soviet Union returns to intervene, albeit limitedly, in the world class struggle. If the workers' state has survived and kept going, it is because capitalism was too feeble to destroy it. Even when capitalism used the USSR in its internal struggle, the Second World War, it could not destroy it because, among other things, capitalism has an insane mode of thinking. Its political and social leaders believed that the USSR was going to collapse because it was isolated, and Nazi Germany could finish it off. As capitalism believed this, it hoped that the onslaught of Germany would suffice, and that, once Germany had exhausted itself, it could become the other capitalist's prey. It turned out otherwise. Nazi Germany was destroyed, and 13 other countries besides the USSR became workers' states. Stalin thought himself omnipotent, but he and Stalinism were eliminated. The workers' state showed in all its historic might when it continued to develop and progress after Stalin. Rest assured that Soviet committees, power committees of the masses, are going to come back in the revolutionary process. One day, everyone will recognize that the workers' state had been a stage of transition towards a society governed by Soviets. At least in the main revolutionary centers of the future, and even before the production apparatus has become adequate, people will start imposing the equalization of salaries. The conditions already exist for the Soviet Union to intervene as the most decisive factor of anti-imperialist struggle in the world. The conditions exist for the Soviet Union to support the revolutionary movements already fighting to bring down the capitalist system. J. Posadas, December 29, 1974. So that's the end of the audiobook. Um, obviously, many of these predictions did not come true. For one, the USSR <laughs> ceased to exist a little over 15 years after Posadas wrote this, whereas China still exists. Now, many people, you know, China is a controversial subject in uh, the U.S. left, at least. Uh, some people believe it's socialist, others don't, although some of the people who believe that it is not socialist do think that it is at least uh, a red social democracy or something somewhat resembling socialism. Uh, I tend to be more on the socialist side, although clearly there have been many struggles and setbacks. Uh, that's for another video. In fact, I recently did run a poll on the channel asking people, do you believe China is socialist? Why or why not? And asking a few questions, and I'll be producing that video in about another two weeks. Anyway... So, yeah, there wasn't a nuclear war, at least not yet. We hope that there never is. Um, Posadas, I think, you know, according to the spirit of the time, you know, granted this was 1974, was not um, totally out of line making some of these predictions. I mean, things, you know, it's, it's just, I'll defend Posadas insofar as it's hard to make these kind of grand predictions. I mean, for, for example, right now, COVID came out of nowhere, was a very much a game changer. You can say that, you know, it uh, just impacted existing trends and, you know, exposed existing weaknesses of capitalism. Yes, but it also definitely weakened capitalism to a point that wouldn't have happened, at least in the same way and on the same timeline as if it hadn't. And the fact is that time matters in this world. <laughs> We live in a world comprised of space and time, and time matters, and particularly when there are competitions between capitalism as one mode of production, and all the people who support that, and socialism as another mode of production, and all the people who support that, they're trying to get the upper hand and destroy the other, and time is a factor in that. It just simply is. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk today about a new Cold War that the U.S. is on behalf of the imperialist global system, of which the U.S. is the leading edge uh, and the military muscle, trying to get a Cold War started to stop China. They thought that China was going to be just their global sweatshop. China said, thank you very much for all this capital and information technology, and they're now using it for themselves. In fact, they're developing to a point where I wonder if it's really too late now for the U.S. to even hurt them by pulling out. Sure, they could set them back somewhat by pulling some of that capital out. China has a lot of their own stuff now. So, 
you know, and I think that the U.S. sees no turning back in terms of what is the U.S. going to do, pull their manufacturing back. Anyway, uh, a lot of things happening is the point. Trying to make large scale predictions uh, can be difficult. You know, for example, in this case, I would predict that the pandemic and uh, all of, you know, just repeated, you had 2008, now you have this, you have a rising fascist movement in the United States and, you know, repeated economic crises. Um, the United States is going down the toilet. I don't know, it'd probably take about 20 years to completely get flushed, but, you know, we don't know. Things can happen suddenly and unpredictably. Nobody has all the data. I mean, people were saying before 2008, for example, that, hey, there's a crisis uh, coming, but nobody could actually see the exact dimensions of it or probably very few people. So anyway, I see nothing but more crisis and destruction for the United States, while it seems like, for example, as global superpowers go, China is much better positioned. They actually took care of the pandemic comparatively much, much, much better than the United States, which is now getting wrecked by Delta and literally just has political factions like screaming at the top of their lungs, let us catch a virus and die. Let us die. You almost wonder if the country has a collective death wish. So you have that country uh, against a rising power that is at least, let's say, half socialist, uh, trying to just make everybody happy here. Um, you know, who do you think is going to win? So things change. I guess that's all I'm saying. Uh, predictions are a valuable exercise. Um, Posadas made many, most of which didn't come true. But uh, then again, he was a Trotskyist. Okay, in seriousness, though, um, on the central point of the China-USSR unification, would it have been a good thing? I do think so, yes. I think it's very unfortunate, deeply unfortunate, that the China-USSR split happened. I know that there are some reasons that seem like good reasons at the time for that. Uh, it's just a terrible shame, in my opinion, that those two powers were not able to resolve their differences better. And I think that the only people who really won out of that split ultimately were capitalists. Again, I understand that there were things happening at the time that were turbulent. And, you know, it's hard to look 50 years down the line clearly and see ahead what the consequences of everything are going to be. However, um, yeah, I just I think that this was an avoidable problem that did lead to the weakening of the international socialist movement. Now, again, like I said, I don't know, you know, there can be just kind of surprise blind twists in history uh, that seem to come out of nowhere, and then we can only see in hindsight how they happened. Or maybe more accurately, the particular triggers of it, we can understand the overall dynamics very well, but where the particular triggers come from can sometimes seem trivial and unpredictable. As Lenin said, paraphrasing, vast expanses of time can pass in which very little happens, and then sometimes very short periods of time happen in which, you know, it's like all that time and history got compressed into like a matter of months. And that's the part that we don't know. We can definitely understand structural factors, but sometimes once things get moving, it's boom, 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 and, you know, the rate at which things happen. And like I said, I was talking about time, that timing can have a huge factor and uh, that kind of nitty gritty gets unpredictable. Anyway, I think that the China-USSR-Sino-Soviet split, um, like I said, did weaken uh, the international socialist movement um, and the differences behind that I, I really wish had been resolved some other way, whether that was possible or not for another video, but those are my thoughts. We're going to leave it there, and thanks to everyone listening. Thanks to the current patrons. What do you think? Leave a comment below. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. All of those donations are very encouraging. They also materially help me, so I really appreciate all of you. And if you would like to help out but can't donate, totally understandable. Liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting all helps to boost the channel. Uh, particularly if you can spread these videos onto Facebook or whatever social media you're using. That's helpful as we are not on Facebook. Banned three times and not going back anytime soon. 
We are on Twitter now, though, at SocialismS4A if you want to follow us there. Otherwise, thanks again for listening, and we will see you in the next video.